Hey friends, welcome back to another episode of Theology in the Raw. My guest today is Dr. Jordan Mallon, who is a uh, paleontologist who specializes in um, in research on dinosaurs, specifically dinosaur ecology, and he has a special interest in horned dinosaurs. He is one of the few, there's only about a thousand people like Jordan who are actual paleontologists who specialize in research on dinosaurs. Uh, Jordan is also a Christian, so we spend a, the bulk of our time understanding the history of research uh, about dinosaurs, what we know, what we don't know, what we used to think we knew, and now um, where our knowledge has been corrected. We talk about dating dinosaurs, um, not like romantic dating, but, you know, figuring out how old these dinosaurs were. And then, uh, you know, um, once we start mentioning dates and years and ages, then that's going to get into more theological questions about the age of the earth and how our understanding of dinosaurs contributes to how we can date the age of the earth, specifically whether it's a young earth or an old earth. So we get into all that and much more. So please welcome to the show, the one and only Jordan Mallon. All right. Hey, friends. I'm here with uh, Dr. Jordan Mallon, uh, the first paleontologist I've ever had on the show. So uh, I've, I've recorded over a thousand episodes. So thanks for uh, breaking us, breaking some new ground with us. <laughs> Happy to do it. Yeah, there's, you know, there aren't a ton of paleontologists in the world, so I'm not surprised to hear I might be the first on your show. <laughs> I, I'm, cur- I'm curious, like a rough estimate. Are we talking like a few hundred, a few thousand, a few dozen or... Oh, probably talk. You're you're talking in the hundreds. Possibly, oh, wow. it, it really depends. I'm a vertebrate paleontologist, right? <laughs> and uh, so I work on on animals with backbones, effectively. And there's an international society called the the Society of Vertebrate Paleontology. We meet every year, and there's upwards of you know 800 people there, maybe. Wow. Not everyone shows up to it, so I'm sure we're over a thousand, but um, we're not in the the many thousands of people. That's for certain. Interesting. So I have to ask, how did you get into this? To give, give us your backstory. I mean, it's such a niche field. Um, is this you love learning about dinosaurs as a kid, or something, or was there something more <laughs> more to it? Than that? Yeah, I was a pretty typical kid. I, I like dinosaurs. I, you know, every kid likes dinosaurs, and I just say I never outgrew them. At, at some point, most people outgrow them for one reason or another. You know, we, we can't all be paleontologists. There just aren't that many jobs to fill. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's been a passion of mine ever since I was a kid. I, I grew up in Ottawa, uh, which, is, was, which is where I'm at now, in Ottawa in Canada. And uh, there are fossils around here. No dinosaur fossils, mind you. But, okay. you know, I found my first fossils as a kid, which sort of uh, – you know, inspired me. I saw Jurassic Park in theaters when I was 13 years or I was 11 years old, actually. And, uh, you know, that that had an influence on me, as I'm sure it did many other paleontologists my age. Yeah. Uh, I grew up going to the Canadian Museum of Nature, which is actually where I work now. And so I grew up, you know, looking at dinosaurs in the museum and mm-hmm. all these sort of little things kept me on the straight and narrow. And, you know, I knew when I was quite young that I wanted to be a paleontologist. And you do, you do specialize now in, in dinosaurs, right? Is that, or or all vertebrates or? No, I, I specialize in dinosaurs at the museum. Um, I was specifically hired to work on dinosaurs. I do work on other things. I, you know, I, I publish on, uh, fossil turtles. Sometimes I publish on, uh, marine reptiles, but, Okay. You know, my, my bread and butter is dinosaurs. Okay. So, um, can you give us a brief history of dinosaur research? Like how far back does it go? When did we first discover something that we were like, Hey, this is something we've never seen before. And it might be a dinosaur. Like what, what's the history of research? And, and then I'm going to ask you kind of like what's changed in our knowledge of dinosaurs throughout that history. Oh boy. Yeah. That's <laughs> a big question. <laughs> uh, you know, the, the first scientific discoveries of dinosaurs go back to really the, the Victorian era, if not maybe a little before. But, you know, I'm certain that people were finding dinosaurs long before then. Uh, you know, we have stories of, uh, you know, um, you know, First Nations folks here in Canada, at least, uh, referring to you know, the bones of the, the grandfather of the buffalo, 
you know, so so they did have stories for dinosaurs, you know, that that predate the sort of modern scientific era. But uh, they obviously interpreted them in a in a very different way. And it really wasn't until the Victorian era, you know, the the early to mid 1800s okay. that we actually uh, came up with the word dinosaur. It wasn't even, a you know, a word before then. So, um, you know, the first finds were made uh, in places like uh, England in the Western world, really, the, the first scientifically documented finds England and in New Jersey and the United States, you know, Hadrosaurus, which was one of the first named dinosaurs, at least in North America, uh, uh, came out of New Jersey. Um, and, you know, the first finds were very, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Very scrappy, I suppose, in nature. It was a tooth here, piece of a jaw there, you know, a toe yeah. bone here, a, a leg bone there. Um, and uh, actually, it was the finding of, of Hadrosaurus in New Jersey where we, we came to realize that these dinosaurs were, were big sort of bipedal, in some cases, uh, animals that we had a hard time fathoming before then. Hmm. Um, I already have a bunch of questions, but... Um, <laughs> Good. <laughs> well, I... I, I do want to, you know, I'm, I'm here. I'm, I'll just ask it now, just because I'm just so I don't forget. But um, I've often like you go to these museums and you see these massive, you know, skeletons, fully put together dinosaur, and the pictures in the background of what it looked like. And then you look closely, and there's like an odd colored, you know, half of a kneecap, and like, and this is the actual bone we found. You know? Yeah. <laughs> is that, is that, I mean, because you mentioned in passing that you know sometimes a tooth here, a jawbone there. Um, are we reconstructing? this massive dinosaur out of like tiny, tiny pieces. And I'm going to assume that it's not just, you know, when you see something doesn't make sense to you, it's like, well, how do we know it looked like this? You know, but I'm, I'm going to assume there's more to it than, than that. But is that, are we reconstructing huge replicas out of small pieces? Are we finding, or have we found a lot more now over the years? Well, we, we found a ton now. Okay. Uh, what you're saying, the sort of scenario that you're setting up uh, was true in the early days of, okay. of looking for these animals, right? So again, back in the Victorian era, you know, there was a, one of the first dinosaurs named was Megalosaurus, and it was named on the basis of a partial jaw fragment. And uh, when paleontologists were trying to reconstruct what they thought the animal looked like, you know, they knew it was effectively a big carnivorous reptile of some kind, and that's all they could say. And so they reconstructed the animal as being this big quadrupedal beast, uh, you know, maybe for lack of a better word, it, it looked like a big lumbering dragon, I suppose. Um, but um, in the intervening, you know, 150 years, we've found many, many, many dinosaur skeletons that, uh, that are complete and articulated. And oh. we have you know, dozens of examples. The animals that you see in the museums today are are quite accurate. In many cases, we have the entire skeleton. In some cases, you know, the fossil record is incomplete more often than not. And in some cases, we only have half a skeleton or maybe a quarter of a skeleton. And if we were to make a, a reconstruction of a dinosaur in a museum, we would have to fill in the blanks with other closely related animals, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, we can do that with a with a, a pretty good degree of confidence, given what we know about the, the dinosaur fossil record now. So yes, it is true that way back when we were we were, you know, we, we were ne necessarily had to guess what these animals look like. And in hindsight, we were horribly wrong. But that's the nature of science, right? It's an ever changing thing. But now, uh, you know, it, we have a, I would say we have a pretty good understanding of the basic build of these things. Okay, well, that's helpful. I, I didn't know we had so much now. So so what did we think, what did we think we knew about dinosaurs, say, 50, 100 years ago? And what do we know now? Like, how, how, is the, how has our knowledge shifted and grown over the years and changed and been corrected in, in general? I'm sure there's, <laughs> I'm sure you have... You can probably do a whole dissertation on, on that question. But. You could, absolutely. Well, one thing that springs immediately to mind, our, our, our first ideas about what dinosaurs were, you know, stemmed from the fact that they have the, 
the shapes they're they're basically built on the same body plan as uh, as reptiles that we see today. Okay. You know, they have the same almost amorphous long bones. If you look at a mammal bone, they're very chiseled and uh, very distinctive, whereas reptile bones are not. Hmm. And dinosaurs are very reptilian in the way that that their bones are are structured. Um, and so. You know, their teeth, likewise, are very reptilian as opposed to very mammalian, right? Dinosaurs didn't have uh, um, um, molars in the way that, that mammals do, in the way that you and I do. And so there was an early understanding that, that dinosaurs uh, uh, were reptiles. And so they were reconstructed as being just overgrown reptiles, you know, and the thinking was that they were cold blooded and and slow to move about and they dragged their tails on the ground a lot like a reptile. And it really wasn't uh, until the 1960s, 70s, 80s in that sort of window there that uh, the idea really caught on amongst paleontologists that dinosaurs probably weren't just reptiles they were they were uh in some cases possibly warm-blooded we know we certainly know they didn't drag their tails on the ground because we have dinosaur trackways that don't show tail dragging marks right huh, and of course this is also the time when it became widely accepted among paleontologists that that dinosaurs gave rise to birds and in fact some are quite closely related to birds uh in fact nowadays we know that some groups of dinosaurs had feathers just like birds do. And, and so maybe we were mistaken in thinking they were merely reptiles. Some of them may have been more bird-like and had faster metabolisms uh, that, that went along with that. Hmm. So that's really one big way in which our, our thinking on dinosaurs has changed is we've gone from thinking We've gone from thinking of all of them as just these big lumbering reptilian beasts to being more fleet footed animals capable of, you know, quickly chasing down their prey. Some of them showed parental uh, behaviors. Some of them traveled in in packs and in, you know, large groups, which lizards typically do not do today. Um so, yeah, there's been a revolution really in our thinking about dinosaurs over the last Oh, 50 years now or so. So, so some, are you saying some would be kind of more reptilian and others not, or, or they, they all as a class would not be reptilian or. Yeah. Well, the, the thing I think that many people fail to appreciate is the fact that, you know, dinosaurs are, we're talking about a big group of animals, right? Okay. You know, when I say dinosaur, it, it, it's a very generalized term in the same way that mammal is a generalized ah, term. Okay. If you think of mammals today, right, while well, there are whales in the sea, you know, these are the biggest animals that ever lived. You know, the blue whale is the biggest animal that we know of, past and present. The biggest animal on Earth today or of that ever lived on Earth yeah. is the blue whale, and it's here with us now. We've also got things like mice scurrying about today, right? Uh, mice, of course, are mammals as well. So between mice and blue whales, you run the gamut from big and small animals and, and terrestrial and seagoing animals. And the same, broadly speaking, is true of dinosaurs in the sense that there were big dinosaurs, there were little dinosaurs, there were probably dinosaurs that were uh, more warm-blooded than cold-blooded, and there were probably dinosaurs that were more cold-blooded than warm-blooded. Mammals, you know, mammals have uh, very different uh, rates of metabolism too, you know. Um, you know, I'm thinking of uh, things like uh, echidnas or, or duck-billed platypus. Mm -hmm. um, they have relatively slow meta uh, reptilian metabolisms hmm. compared to the you know, uh, placental mammals, you know, animals like you, mammals like you and I, you know, we're mammals too. And we have relatively high metabolism. So dinosaurs, you know, ran the gamut as far as all those differences are concerned as well. Okay. You mentioned feathers because I heard recently that we now know dinosaurs had feathers, but you said maybe certain kinds. What do we know about 
Is it just the bird like the ones that fly, or is it a, 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 even like the land dinosaurs also had feathers? And how do we know that based on a skeleton? Yeah. Um, well, we don't know that based on the okay. skeleton. We we well. I should say that there, there's some, I can think of an exception to that, but, um, it was realized many years ago, actually, you know, the turn of the last set century, the first paleontologists were having their suspicions that, um, dinosaurs and birds share a lot in common and, you know, skeletally, as far as their skeletal uh, structure is concerned. And some paleontologists even had some suspicions that, Maybe dinosaurs had feathers, but we had no fossil evidence to that effect. It wasn't until the mid 1990s, which I remember very well, uh, that that paleontologists started discovering the first feathered dinosaurs in China, hmm. in places like uh, Lujitun province in China, where we started finding um, these really a poorly explored uh you know, set of deposits before then. But in the 90s, paleontologists started finding uh, feathered dinosaurs there. Um, and these were, by and large, small animals. You know, they were what we would call uh, theropods or, broadly speaking, the meat-eating dinosaurs. The feathered ones appear to be small meat-eating dinosaurs. But we've since found larger meat-eating dinosaurs, including early tyrannosaur relatives, that had feathers as well. Huh. That's not to real, say though. Real quick, real quick, Jordan, the, are we actually finding the fossil of the feather? Like, is that we are we are finding? Yeah, we're not finding the original feathers per se. Okay. Those don't really fossilize, but we are finding the feather impressions in the rock. So surrounding the the skeleton, the in, intact skeleton, uh, we often find. Uh, uh, impressions of the feathers and they're unmistakable right you can oh, wow. see the the sort of central barb or rachis and coming off that you get the 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 barbs and the barbules that come off that central rachis um so they're unmistakable as feathers you know if yeah. if you saw them if you saw that thing today you would say oh yeah that's a feather no doubt about it um so yeah, it's it's mainly out of China that we've been finding these small feathered dinosaurs, and in in some cases larger feathered dinosaurs, in the last thirty years or so. But um, even long before we found those feathered animals, we we found uh, scaly dinosaurs as well. You know, duck-billed dinosaurs, the hadrosaurs we find very commonly here in Canada, find them in the United States as well. Very common animals and. Uh, and it's not uncommon that we find them with scale impressions. Uh, they they cert they almost certainly didn't have feathers. Uh, we found scales all over the body, and you can go to the American Museum of Natural History now and mm. and see one of these so-called dinosaur mummies there with, you know, it's a mummy is a misnomer because the actual skin itself isn't preserved, but we do find the impressions of the skin preserved. Mm. Um, and, and, you know, there's an Edmontosaurus at the American Museum of Natural History uh, that has an entirely scaly body. Hmm. So all that is to say dinosaurs had – some dinosaurs had feathers and some dinosaurs had scales. No doubt about it. What's the function what, – what does that tell us about the habitat? Is, and if I – I'm not a – I know nothing about this field. So if I ask – if my question's so intrinsically stupid, just let me know. I'm not offended. So <laughs> – well, yeah. So scales versus feathers, what does that tell us about the habitat? Is it a weather thing? Is it uh, something else? Well, um, yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Uh, and I think it ties up to the question of why do we think – you know, scales evolved in the first, or, or rather feathers. Why did feathers evolve in the first place? Feathers today, you know, we find feathers strictly in birds today, and they're used for a variety of purposes. They're used for insulation. They're used for, you know, display. Think of the peacock, right? Mm -hmm. Peacock's got a big fan of tail feathers that it uses to attract uh, a mate. Uh, we think of feathers uh, probably first and foremost as being used for flying. Mm -hmm. And we know with good certainty that, you know, the first dinosaurs that we find in the fossil record 
were not capable of flying because they just didn't they didn't have wings. Um, and so almost certainly feathers were used um, for something else. Insulation seems like a, a good answer um, in that the first feathers, it, it, you can actually trace, as you go through the fossil record, you can actually trace the evolution of feathers. Hmm. So the first feathers that we find in the fossil record are very simple structures. They kind of look like hair. You know, they, they, they're not highly branched like you see in a feather today. They're, they're very hair-like. And those were not very aerodynamic. They were probably not great for display in the sense that, you know, you couldn't fan them out the way a peacock can. So probably the first feathers um, were used for some kind of, of insulation. And then maybe later on they were co-opted for be it display or for for flying uh, as they grew more complex, uh, you know, and again, you can trace that, that complexity through the fossil record. As you look at younger and younger uh, dinosaurs and birds in the fossil record, you can see the feathers, the feathers really evolved through time, mm. you know, um, but they almost certainly didn't come about as a way of means of flying. They were probably a way of uh, insulating these, small, uh, small meat eating dinosaurs, you know, when you're small, you lose body heat mm -hmm. to the environment very quickly. And especially if these small meat eating dinosaurs were, were warm blooded, they would want to find a way of keeping that heat, you know, mm -hmm. within themselves, not losing the heat to their environment. So maybe that was, uh, maybe it was an adaptation to living in sort of cool environments, particularly if these were warm blooded animals. Um, hopefully that gets at your question. Preston. I never really thought about like the difference between, cause I, my, where my non-scientific brain is going is like, well, why not fur? Isn't fur better than feathers? I always think, yeah, feathers is for aviation. I think it's lighter. Like if I saw a dog flying, the, well, I don't know. Like, like <laughs> I would imagine a, a bird would do better with feathers than a bunch of fur, but, um, I don't, I never really thought about the difference between a feather and a fur in terms of function, but yeah, well, well, <laughs> Yeah, that, why not fur? Well, fur is a strictly mammalian, mm. uh, mammalian thing, right? We do not see fur anywhere else but in in mammals. It, it has a very strict definition. Now, the first feathers were very fur-like, but they weren't uh, they weren't exactly the same in the way that these things develop. But they can serve the same purpose. You know, fur, fur, the fur that we see in, in mammals is, is by and large, again, a means of insulation. And uh, the downy feathers that we see in birds, again, downy feathers, if you were to, you know, look at the breast of a chicken, it's covered in down. And um, it doesn't, that, that, that down isn't very useful for flying. Uh, it, it, it's, it serves better as a way of insulating the animal and maybe stuffing your pillows, I suppose. Yeah. But um, although those downy feathers uh, are not fur per se, they still serve the same function. Okay. Um, so, so yeah, hopefully that gets at, yeah, yeah. at your question. Feathers and fur, not the same thing. But they they can serve the same function and they do a good job of it in, in both cases. Let's um I, I got a lot of questions actually on Twitter on on um on dating. What's our method? I guess wh wh how old would you put dinosaurs? What era did they live? And how accurate and how do we know that? And how accurate is our knowledge of dating dinosaurs? Mm. So when it comes to dating, di you know our 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 best sort of estimates right now dinosaurs the first dinosaurs that that we find are on the order of you know 230 235 million years thereabouts those are the first ones that we find in the fossil record that's not to say that there weren't dinosaurs that predated that but as i say the fossil record is incomplete by by its very nature and so it might be that the very first dinosaurs uh predate that by you know, millions of years and we just haven't found them yet. Mm -hmm. uh, and we think that the, the, the current best estimate for their extinction was about 66 million years ago. So, so, you know, dinosaurs are around for, 
you know, greater than 150 million years, 160 million years. Um, and, and how do we know that? Well, a lot of people think that we date dinosaur bones directly in the way that we date, say, the bones of uh, ancient humans that we might find in the fossil record or the bones of, uh, you know, mammoths or, or, or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, but for those more recent animals, uh, again, humans, mammoths, things that have died in the last, I don't know, 10,000 years, 50,000 years, um, we use carbon dating for that, but but carbon dating only has a window. Uh, you know, it, 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 it's only useful uh, as a dating method for something on the order of uh, tens of thousands of years. We cannot carbon date dinosaur bones by large because there's no carbon left in the bones. Okay. Um, dinosaur bones are by and large, you know, they're they're they're, they're rock by and large. Hmm. Um, much. Uh, much, if not all, of the organic content in the bone has been replaced by mineral. Hmm. Uh, they, you know, if you pick up a dinosaur bone, it's heavy. It's heavy like a rock. If you were to pick up a dinosaur bone, uh, let's say it's a dinosaur bone that has the length of a of a human leg bone, a thigh bone, the femur. You know, if you were to hold a human femur in one hand and a dinosaur bone that's the same size in the other hand, the dinosaur bone is noticeably heavier Hmm. and the reason is is that all the organic content has been replaced with with mineral content it's it's our it's become a rock Hmm. um but we don't date those dinosaur bones what we do is we date the rocks that we find them in so i do a lot of my work for example in uh in alberta here in canada and if i find a dinosaur in the rock record uh, if I want to determine how old it is, I will want to study the ash deposits um, that are found in and around the rocks where I found the dinosaur. So we're able to date volcanic ash uh, using radiometric dating methods. And um, it's those ashes, those ash layers, at least where I work in Alberta, that we date. And if I'm able to date an ash layer radiometrically, and I, I should put a caveat on this, I don't actually do that dating. I leave that to, to the geologists. We, it, it, it's a, a collaborative project, paleontology is. But by dating those ashes, we're able to say, well, the, you know, this one volcanic ash, which occurs, you know, five meters below our dinosaur fossil, it dates to 71 and a half million years and the next volcanic ash that we find above the dinosaur fossil dates to 71.9 million years. Therefore, we're able to say that the dinosaur is somewhere in between those ages, right? That makes sense. How accurate is that dating when you date the ash? Is that pretty accurate? It's, it's, it's pretty accurate, and it's becoming more and more accurate. Uh, you know, and, and so... I mentioned the Lugitun fossils uh, in China, where we find these feathered dinosaurs very often. Um, the dating of those beds is to within tens of thousands to, I think, hundreds of thousands of years, wow. which you know sounds like a lot. But when you step back and you consider the fact that these beds are, I think it's 125 millions of years that range of error is relatively quite small i, I, no, I was i was gonna say like w- if it's within like five to ten million give or take five to ten million years that would no. be pretty impressive you're saying oh it's way more precise than that like we're not they're not it's, off by 50 million years or something it, yeah that's exactly right yeah huh. where it's you know it's orders and orders and orders of magnitude smaller hmm. than okay. you know those uh, the ages that we that we put on these things. So yeah, it's, that, it's, it's quite accurate. That's somewhat. So I spent a little bit of time in Israel and I did some archeological. Well, <laughs> that sounds sexier than it is. Archeological digs. I hauled buckets of dirt out of Hezekiah's tunnel and learn, you know, listen to archeologists give talks and everything. Anyway, um, it's very similar there. Like when you determine that, when did this, when was the city destroyed? There's always a burn layer. And then you look at all the stuff that's in that same burn layer 
And then, you know, from kind of cross checking, like this kind of pottery was popular in the 12th century, you know, this kind of, you know, wall structure or whatever. So, I mean, you, you, you don't, and, and I guess that, I mean, you do do carbon dating then because it's within a you know couple thousand years or whatever. But like you also look at all the other stuff that's in that same burn layer. So it sounds like it's kind of similar that looking at things that you can date that are next to those bones. That makes yes, a lot it's of sense. exactly the same. There's a lot of uh, there are many parallels between paleontology and archaeology. In fact, so many that hmm. the two are confused for one another all the time. <laughs> I'm often asked if you know I'm a, if I do archaeology, yeah. um, which you know, isn't true, but, um, yes, many of the, many of the approaches and the methods are the same just because we're dealing with, with ancient history, you know, we can't go out and see a living, you know, Tyrannosaurus today. And so we need to answer the questions we might have using methods and approaches that are similar to what we would use in archeology, span because you, you know, you can't go back and ask the ancient Egyptians how they did things. Right, right. <laughs> so, you, I mean, there, there is, I guess, a you opened up an elephant, a dinosaur in the room here with, uh, you know, saying it's millions and millions of years old. So that that would, um, I mean, I have to ask a question about, you know, dating the age of the earth. Because <laughs> some people would say, you know, young earth, 6 to 10,000, 20,000 years old. Old earth is, you know, millions of years old. Um, you fall in the old earth camp. I, I would say the majority of my audience is probably there. I think that's obvious by the way. What's that? <laughs> so I, I guess I, I, said, I think that's obvious by now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, I get what, what's my question. So <clears throat> your knowledge of dinosaurs and when they lived, would you say that that is simply incompatible with an young earth? Or if you were to, if you were to steal man, the young earth view, like what's the best kind of counter argument? Did they say like, no, Jordan, your dating's all wrong. It can't be, you know, 60 to 150 million years old. These dinosaurs must have lived a few thousand years ago and there's scientific arguments to back that up. Or I, what would be the counter argument? How would a young earther respond to what you're saying? If Again, if you could put their best foot forward. Mm. If you, if you even know, I mean, I don't know if you interact with like young earth scientists. Well, I was, you know, I was raised to believe in a young earth, not, not actively. I didn't have this drilled into my head, but this was sort of the, the paradigm in, in which, you know, my church worked growing up. So, um, you know, the idea is not foreign to me. Um, but I, I, you know the young earth paradigm and young earthers will will tell you this they their their belief in a young earth doesn't come from science it comes from their interpretation of the bible right and so if the if the um if the working assumption from the get go a priori is that the bible tells us that yeah. the earth is young then Science be damned, right? Um, yeah. we, we'll, the thinking is we will only accept the science if it agrees with our preconception of what the, the Bible tells us, right? Uh, I, I have some misgivings about that because, uh, you know, I, I, I don't agree that the Bible necessarily teaches a young earth. I, yeah. I think that's... I, 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 you know, I think that's putting too fine a point on on what the Bible is actually trying to tell us. I don't think the Bible. I don't take that what we call a concordus perspective. I I don't think the Bible is trying to teach us about, you know, the history of the earth. There's a famous saying, right? The Bible was written to teach us how to get to heaven, not how the heavens go. You know. <laughs> Uh, there's another one too that's very similar, which is escaping my mind. Right, to, the Bible was written to teach us about the Rock of Ages, not the ages of the rocks. Right? <laughs> yeah. So if if you know if, if you take that interpretation that the, the Bible was written to teach us about the ages of the rocks, um, then you're sort of forcing yourself to work within that concordus paradigm and to try to draw some kind of uh, interpretation from the Bible, some kind of meaning that that speaks to the age of the earth. But 
I think if the Bible were trying to do that, I think it could have done so much more clearly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. This episode is sponsored by World Concern. World Concern is a Christian humanitarian organization that is addressing some of the most significant needs in the world today. For instance, there's been a devastating drought that's hit Somalia. I don't know if you've heard about this, but it's become one of the largest humanitarian crises in the world today. Uh, Four relentless years of drought have destroyed the country of Somalia. In 2022 alone, over 40,000 people have been killed from the drought and uh, children and and families continue to have ongoing needs, the basic necessities of life, food, water, and of course, ultimately the love of Christ. So for instance, a a young mom named uh, Saifia had over 50 sheep prior to the drought. And now after the drought, she only has one sheep, which means she basically has no income and no way to feed her children. And yet this is one of many stories we could tell about the horrific effects of the drought in Somalia. So through World Concern, you can provide urgently needed food, water, and emergency supplies to families in need. 12 bucks can feed a family for a whole month. I mean, that's crazy. 12 bucks feeds a family for a whole month. So I invite you to pray. We should always pray. And I invite you to take action. Please consider giving a gift of 12 bucks no, let's say 24 bucks. Let's let's help two families. Uh, consider giving a gift of 12, 24 or more you know, dollars to help families survive this hunger crisis. You can give today at worldconcern.org forward slash theology. That's worldconcern.org forward slash theology to embody the love of Christ toward family and children in need. This episode is sponsored by Biola University. Biola is consistently ranked as one of the nation's leading Christian universities. Biola has over 300 academic programs at both the undergraduate and graduate levels, which are available both in Southern California and online. With leading academic programs like business, film, science, and more, Biola's biblically integrated curriculum helps students grow closer to God and gain a deeper understanding of Scripture. In fact, I was just uh, at the Biola campus a few weeks ago. I, I toured the campus and talked with several deans and professors, and every single one I talked to was so passionate about making Christ first in all things. I mean, Biola's quality of academics is well documented. There's no doubt about that. But I was most impressed with how utterly Christ-centered the school is. So at Biola, students become equipped for a thriving life and career. They'll learn how to articulate their Christian beliefs. And most of all, they'll be prepared to serve as God's instrument in their community and around the world. Now, through June 1st, um, 2023, you can use the promo code PRESTON to waive the application fee for any Biola program. Okay, the deadline used to be May 1st. They actually extended it for our audience to June 1st. So get your application in before June 1st. Uh, Put in the code PRESTON and get your application fee waived. Uh, Some restrictions may apply. Just visit www.biola.edu for more information. I guess, I mean, I was always taught in, again, yeah, I didn't study these things. It just kind of absorbed, it was kind of just in the air, you know, but I dabbled a little bit with Answers in Genesis and other um, other thinkers on this. And and it seemed like the, and again, I, I might be, um, this is going back 35 plus years now. Um, but I like, like the, uh, uh, like God created the earth with the appearance of age. And it seems mm-hmm. like that's kind of punted into whenever we see something that seems to be scientifically like, no, this is millions of years old. It's like, well, no, God created the world 10,000 years ago and he put, you know, dinosaur bones in the earth that look like they're millions of years old or maybe aren't, you know, but like it's, it's, it's kind of like the light from the stars, you know, it takes millions of years to get here. Well, God created it immediately that way it's not like it he had to wait for the light to get there it's like he created the appearance of age yes I, I hope i'm not butchering that that argument but i've been i've encountered the, that argument before too uh uh including from my own uh grandmother-in-law okay. right she you know she's a very devout christian and you know we've not had any in-depth conversations about it but i've I've got wind from her that she thinks dinosaurs were not real living animals, but they were, they were, God put them in the fossil record maybe as a way to uh, test our faith or, or I don't know. When I lived back in Calgary, I went to graduate school. I got my PhD in Calgary here in Canada. And I remember our neighbor at the time too, um, 
in our apartment uh, didn't think dinosaurs were real. And he knew that I was studying to be a paleontologist. And he came back from the Royal Tyrrell Museum of Paleontology in Drumheller one day. And he said, you know, Jordan, he said, before now, I didn't think that the dinosaurs were real. But I went to the museum and I saw I saw the bones and I could put my hand on them. And he said, I, I think maybe they they are real now. And I said, well, you know, welcome to the club. <laughs> but, you know, if. If they weren't real, if, if God put them in the ground, um, th- almost as a way of deceiving us, I don't know that that's a God that that I would want to worship, <laughs> you know, a God that would mislead us like that. I, I find that, you know, theologically problematic, let's say. And, you know, it's not just the bones themselves, you know. We can look at the isotopes in the bone and those isotopes in the bone can tell us something about what the dinosaurs were eating and how they were traveling uh, from one place to another. We can look at their teeth under the microscope and see microscopic pits and scratches on the teeth that reflect how they use their jaws. Like we're talking about microscopic details uh, that would have to be created as well. And f- for what purpose, right? Like it, it, it just, to me, it just boggles the mind to think that these fossils, which scream us, scream to us to mm-hmm. the fact that these, these animals were once, once living, breathing creatures mm-hmm. to say that they were just, you know, put there to test our faith. Just, it, it doesn't seem right. <laughs> So These we, are I, living I, animals. I'm, I'm just now putting this together because I haven't cared about this question in forever. But um, so from a young earth, from a uh, young earth perspective, and, and I don't mean any disrespect to, to young earthers lifting, li, li, I'm, you know, I'm, I do like to test ideas. Okay. So I'm, I'm not after any person or to, trying to demean anybody. I'm just, I want to wrestle with the idea. It seems that from a young earth perspective, you either have to say these bones were put here with the appearance of age, but that and they weren't real. Like they didn't actually live and breathe. They were God put old looking bones in the earth, but dinosaurs actually never lived and breathed and existed. That's that's one response. Or you have to say that the dating is just completely off. No, dinosaurs did live. They were real, but they lived eight thousand years ago. Is that? I mean, I don't. What's the other option? I don't. Uh, it seems like those I, I don't are... know that there are. That I don't know that there is another option. Um, in my experience, it, it's not a common view, even among young Earth creationists, that dinosaurs didn't exist. You know, if you look at, you know, various young Earth ministries, you know, Answers in Genesis being probably the the prime most one. Uh, Institute, I think, of Creation Research is yeah. another one. Um, they don't believe, I don't think, they don't believe that dinosaurs were, were there, put there to test our faith. They, they take the latter view that dinosaurs were real animals, okay. but they think that effectively our scientific dating and, and uh, okay. well, not just paleontology, but, you know, physics and all of science really is, is wrong in, in, in that uh their paradigm is is the right one. Um, so that's the more common view, I think, at least among young Earth creationists. And again, I was one. I, I you know, I, I I I know where that view comes from. Um, and and I in my again in my limited reading, it you, I think you hit the nail on the head that all of the, all of it comes from a one hundred percent absolute commitment that the Bible teaches that the Earth is is young. I remember reading an article, it was like a back and forth between a young earth, old earth, and that was the young earther, maybe it was a podcast, a debate or something, the young earther basically kept saying, I mean, his, pre, his presupposition is his opponent, who's a evangelical believer, you know, is his starting point is you're done denying the Bible. So you don't even believe in the Bible because the Bible clearly teaches young earth. Now let's have a discussion <laughs> about the science. And it's like, well, that... Yeah, if you start there, then there's really no discussion to be had. And yeah, in just in case, in case my audience is wondering, I mean, I would say the major, overwhelming majority of 
evangelical Old Testament scholars would agree with what you said, you know, that, um, that, that, that's, that's an overreading of the Bible. Genesis 1 to 11 in particular is just not trying to give us this kind of like age of the earth. And, and there's all kinds of genre questions, you know, even Genesis 1 to 3. And, and how, yeah, um, how much is the Bible kind of absorbing certain myths around, uh, around in the world that time and playing with them and rebuking them? I mean, it's, it's, Genesis 1 to, 1 to 11 in particular is, is profoundly theological, um, trying to teach us about God, not trying to give us kind of a step-by-step layout of how the world's, you know, came, came to be or whatever. But, um, anyway, I, um, that, that's what did it for me really is because I'm so exegetically wired. I did need to see, you know, why I, I, I can appreciate, you know, like, yeah, if, if the Bible is committed to it, if the Bible itself is teaching a young earth, then I want to take that seriously. But then I, as I kind of really did a lot of study and research in Genesis 1 to 11, like, I, I just don't see that as like the necessary or even really the best reading of, of the actual text of scripture. And once you do that, I mean, the science itself seems overwhelming to me, but, um, yeah, I, I agree with all that Preston. You know, I, I, I think what the Bible is trying to do is very different from what science is trying to do. Science is trying to, science was built by humans as a means of figuring out the natural world and only the natural world, you know, uh, whereas the Bible was written to teach us about our fallen nature and our need for redemption. And, you know, there's certain, certainly places where, you know, those, those two sort of realms, uh, might overlap. Mm -hmm. Um, but, uh, by and large, I think the overlap is relatively minimal. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, um, yeah, I, I agree with you. You know, I know you had, uh, Tremper Longman on your podcast and John Walton and, and I, I think, um, you know, I, I I think their interpretations of, you know, the Adam and Eve story and, uh, the, Mm -hmm. the creation account and, uh, you know, all those early, you know, stories that we're familiar with from the opening chapters of Genesis yeah. are, are are very reasonable, you know, and I don't think they conflict with science whatsoever because they're just, they they do not consider the same questions. Mm-hmm. And, and I like that you said reasonable. Like, I, I don't even need to say like they're 100% correct. Cause even Walton and, and Longman would have, you know, slightly different w- ways of approaching Genesis 2 to 3. Um, but they're, re- they're very credible accounts of scripture. They're, they're reasonable. They're not just forcing into the text something like, oh, the science says this, we're going to begin with science and therefore thrust that into the text and make, make the Bibles, you know, agree with it. It's like, no, these are credible, very credible. I would say the most, more reasonable readings of scripture. Um, I, I, um, there is one theological question though, that comes up in my head and actually some people on Twitter were asking it too. Um, I'm assuming dinosaurs predate humans from an from a scientific perspective. Is that correct? And if so, does that mean we have death before humans? And what does that mean? And you, 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 you said, I'm not a theologian. So I, I don't, if you're like, Hey, I don't, I don't really have a good answer to this. That's fine. Um, but would that create a theological question slash problem that we would have death predating, um, yeah. Adam sin or whatever, you know? Yeah. I, I, it would create a problem for some, I suppose. You're not wrong to say that, you know, dinosaur is, predate humans in the fossil record we never find dinosaurs and and humans together ever oh really okay there have been, there have been some some claims to the contrary you know like i know some creationist organism or, or organisms some creationist organizations have argued that we find you know human footprints with dinosaur footprints in the fossil record but you know lo and behold what we thought were sandal marks are actually just incompletely preserved dinosaur foot, footprints. Oh, really? And okay. You can see actually, they're, yeah, they're just sort of dinosaur footprints with three toes that have, col- the mud has collapsed into the toes. And so you're left with uh, a heel mark that kind of looks superficially like a human footprint, but really is not. Okay. Uh, so we, we, yeah, just as plainly as I can say it, Dinosaurs and humans do not occur in the fossil record together. Uh, Dinosaurs are always found in the lower layers, and the humans are always found in the upper or younger layers. Um, So 
I suppose that means inevitably that that yes, dinosaurs uh, lived and died before human sin, and um, but I'm not convinced that the Bible teaches that that wasn't the case, right? Uh, you know, look at the story of the the Garden of Eden. Um, creates two trees, one of which was uh, the tree of life. <laughs> and what was the purpose of the tree of life? Well, you eat of it and you live forever, right? If, if, if there was no animal death prior to Adam and Eve having eaten of the tree, then what, what was the purpose of that tree? It, just, it doesn't make sense um, to have that tree if humans were made to live forever from from the get go, right? If Adam and Eve were, were created by God as immortal, then what would be the purpose of the tree of life? There there would have been no purpose. So, hmm. you know, just just trying to stick to the the logical consistency of the story, it it, it doesn't make sense that Adam and human, or rather Adam and Eve, were, were created immortal. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, you know, the the Bible also says God told uh, Eve that. You know, in the in the day that you eat of this tree, uh, you will surely die. Well, guess what? They they ate of the tree and they did not drop down dead. Right. Mm-hmm. That suggests to me that probably the death that's being spoken of is a spiritual death as opposed to, uh, you know, a physical death. So that's the way, you know, that's the way that I would interpret that. And again, you know, I, I'm not a theologian and I'm yeah. sure people have much better answers than that. But. This is a this is sort of a, an interpretation that I've that I find completely reasonable and sits well with me and uh, I think makes sense of you know what's written in the Bible in the creation story itself. So I'm I'm very happy with that. And it, I mean we're really dealing with Romans five, First Corinthians fifteen, and maybe a couple other passages. And they're and they're the the life death contrast. I mean, again, I wasn't really prepared to think through this on the podcast, so I, I am thinking out loud. I mean, I've read Romans before, okay? But it, it does seem to be that the – I mean, I think, again, it's a reasonable view that the death and life contrast is referring to people who bear God's image. Like Romans 5.18 says, you know, in in as in Adam all died, therefore in Christ all will be made alive. I don't know if he's thinking of the resurrection of cats there, you know, or – um, sure. Or, you know, trees being, I don't know. Like I, it, it does seem to be more narrowly focused on humans. That's animal death that you're speaking about and dinosaurs right. are animals. And right. so if, you know, if, if it doesn't apply to cats, then it doesn't apply to dinosaurs and, mm-hmm. you know, dinosaurs living and dying before humans were ever around right. is not an issue then on that interpretation. Are the, I'm curious, are, to your knowledge, are there any, paleontologists who, you know, attend like, I don't know, like who have a degree in paleo, who are actual paleontologists that, that are young earthers. Is that a thing? Um, to your knowledge? Yeah, it is a thing. I can't deny it. Uh, there, there, there are very few, and I know many more Christian paleontologists who are old earthers, but, um, there are some, and there are, you know, there are people who even work for these creationist ministries who have a degree in paleontology in some cases uh, who work for these ministries. But, you know, very often they get their degrees and then they never publish another scientific article after that, yeah. you know, just because they, they, they don't do science. They, they, they do, you know, creationist outreach, I suppose. So okay. um, it ha it, yeah, it does happen, um, but I would say they're they're in a small minority, and I would say probably even amongst paleontologists, Christian paleontologists are in a, a small minority too. Well, maybe I maybe that's going too far. There, I I suspect there are many more Christian paleontologists out there than most people realize. Really? Because I know because I know many of them. <laughs> but um, you know, we do exist. We're in a minority, and, and among Christian paleontologists, the young earthers are are. In, yeah. in an even greater or smaller yeah. minority, I suppose. Yeah. Well, let's go back to the dinosa- dinosaurs. Um, why you said they, if I remember correctly, they went extinct uh, sixty-six million years ago. Why, why did, did they go extinct? Do we do we know that? <laughs> um, we have a pretty good idea now. Yeah. Uh, 
you know, if, if, 50 years ago, we really didn't have much of a clue why dinosaurs went extinct. You know, there have been probably a hundred, if not more, uh, sort of guesses as to why that might have been. But we had no evidence to support any of those different ideas. But now I, I think it's safe to say that the, the best supported idea was this idea of a, a meteor hitting the Earth 66 okay. million years ago. And it's, I mean, it's not an idea anymore. We actually found the crater where the meteor hit that dates to the exact time of the extinction of the dinosaurs. Oh, wow. It's in the Yucatan Peninsula uh, near Mexico. Um, really? Huh. And yeah, you can you can see the crater there today. It's it's underground. It's underwater, I should say. You know, you can't just see it with the naked eye, but. We can use, uh, you know, ground penetrating radar and, and sonar to actually trace the, the margins of this crater. And the crater dates to the end of the age of the dinosaurs. So uh, paleontologists and geologists are quite certain that that's probably what did the dinosaurs in. Wait, is that that there's like off the coast, there's that big blue, like huge circle that it's kind of it looks like a crater underwater. Is that? Um, can you off, see it like off, from a camera, like from, from a, like a satellite view or off of right. Mexico? You cannot see it in satellite view. No, you, okay, because again, it's thinking. underwater, it's underwater, but it's in, um, it, yeah, in the Gulf of Mexico, okay. uh, the Yucatan Peninsula is, is where this crater is. And again, it, it's underwater now. Okay. Uh, it was probably, well, I don't know. It was probably underwater back then too, but we're talking about a, a meteor that was, mm you know, tens of kilometers wide wow. hitting the earth, you know, faster than the speed of sound. And, you know, this would have just absolutely devastated the earth. It would have created tsunamis. There's recently been a report of uh, an ancient tsunami um, deposit that dates to the end of the age of the dinosaurs. Uh, we find fishes in that deposit with um, basically beads of glass that uh, were trapped within the gills of these animals that would have rained down from the skies wow. after the impact of this, this, uh, this meteor. Um, it's, a, it's a very impressive site and it was only announced a few years ago. Uh, the, the scientific findings are still coming out of this site. It's called the Tanis site. But uh, they're 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 fairly impressive findings so far, and this appears to be one of these deposits uh, created as a result of this asteroid impact. That's fascinating! Wow, what would have survived that? I mean, <laughs> not much. <laughs> were there animals no, that, or were dinosaurs like one of the only kind of dinosaur? Or I, I, you know, as you said, it's not. We're not talking about like a sp kind of specific species like a monkey. I mean. Dinosaurs are a broad category, but would you say most, if not all, animals kind of died at that time? Or Yeah, uh, by best estimates, uh, about three quarters of life on land died at that time. And there were animals that made it through, obviously. Huh. Uh, you know, birds made it through. Birds had evolved well before uh, the, the extinction of the dinosaurs. So birds made it through. We have them around today, uh, you know crocodiles made it through we have them around today um as far as what didn't make it through um most of what we think of as being dinosaurs you know i would argue that birds are dinosaurs but the the non-bird dinosaurs triceratops and t-rex and mm -hmm. you know montosaurus a lot of these things that you can see in museums today they obviously died um marine reptiles died uh, there are different lineages of turtles and, uh, you know, lizards that died. Um, uh, ammonites died. These were, were sea-going sea invertebrate creatures. They don't make it past the extinction. So there were many, many groups that, uh, that died, and, but a few of them hmm. kind of squeaked through, and they're here with us today. I was I was gonna ask about birds being dinosaurs, um, it, or I was gonna ask more generally, like, are there dinosaurs around today, and what defines a dinosaur being around today? Just 
because I guess that's more the bigger question. Like, yeah, it's, it's almost yeah. a misnomer to say dinosaurs around the day, like birds, like pigeons, and dinosaurs. Like, well, dinosaur just means something that existed as a species prior to, I guess, 66 million well, BC. Well, no, or, no. A lot of people, when, when, when a lot of, you know, lay people hear the word dinosaur, they just think, oh, well, that's just an animal that lived a long time ago but when paleontologists use the word dinosaur we mean something very specific we're okay. talking about a specific branch on the tree of life okay. and there were many animals that lived alongside the dinosaurs you know 66 plus million years ago that were not themselves dinosaurs i mentioned uh. i mentioned crocodiles were around back then uh, there were turtles around back then. And so there they are dinosaurs. You would around. say a crocodile is not a. We shouldn't say they're a dinosaur. They are not a dinosaur. Okay. No, they're they're closely related to dinosaurs, but they are not themselves dinosaurs. Okay. However, I would argue that birds are dinosaurs because they are descended from dinosaurs, right? In the same way that I don't know, a monkey is a mammal because. It shares features with all other mammals, and it's descended from mammals. I would say that birds are dinosaurs because they share many features in common with dinosaurs, and I could name some of those off if you wanted to, uh, and because they are descended from dinosaurs. So in the way that paleontologists think about the relationships of these animals, you can never outgrow your ancestry, right? There will never be a time at which, you know, uh, monkeys stop being mammals or stop being vertebrates because they have fur like a mammal, they have lactation like a mammal, they um, they have a backbone like a vertebrate. Mm -hmm. They will never stop being vertebrates. They might stop, you know, the 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 eventual descendants of monkeys for whatever reason could conceivably stop lactating. But just because you lose that ability to lactate doesn't mean you're no longer a mammal. You you evolved from mammals. And those same arguments apply to birds and, and dinosaurs. You know, birds will always be dinosaurs because they are descendants from that dinosaur branch of the tree of life. Are there any other species around the day that would fit that bill or is it just just birds? As far as descendants of dinosaurs, yeah. are there other descendants yeah. of dinosaurs? No. There were many different types of dinosaurs, but uh, the only type that survives today are birds. Okay. Crocodilians, no. you know, crocs and alligators and gharials, they are not dinosaurs. Uh, they, they have a common ancestor with dinosaurs to the exclusion of most other forms of life. But they are not dinosaurs themselves because they they branched off uh, the tree of life before the dinosaurs even evolved. So, it's, it. so it's, yeah. yeah, interesting. Okay, and is that pretty widely agreed upon? Are you are you saying this is my kind of my theory, or is this among paleontologists? No, this is pretty standard okay. in yeah in paleontology. It's the sort of the the common parlance, so to say. Yeah. I so real quick before I let you go, are you uh, you got a couple more minutes? I'm happy. Yeah, yeah. Let's okay. talk. <laughs> well, no, I just I, I I got a ton. Of, I just glanced at Twitter and I got a ton of questions here. Um, what's interesting is I think we've already answered most of them. A lot of the questions came up are the same ones we wrestled with about you know okay. death and the extinction. Um, here's a question. Obviously, the most important question is what's your favorite Jurassic Park movie? <laughs> oh boy. Um, well, I've seen them all at this stage, whether I like it or not. <laughs> I can tell you my least favorite one was the last one. Okay. And my favorite one, I, I mentioned to you earlier, Preston, I was 11 years old when I saw the first Jurassic Park yeah. movie in theaters. And that was, that, you know, that had an effect on me. So, uh, I, I, you know, from a subjective point of view, it would be that one. And I think from a more objective point of view, it would be that one too, because it was just the better, uh, better written of all the movies. I think most people would agree. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I don't think I've only I've never seen a Jurassic Park movie from beginning to end. I've only seen parts, and I don't know why I haven't finished it. Isn't that crazy? It's worth seeing the first one, and that's about it. Okay, okay. That, that's that's pretty common among. Yeah, that's except true for the movies. except for the Rocky movies. I I, I think Creed yeah. Two is just absolutely incredible. 
on so many yeah. levels. I mean, and most of the raw. I mean, Rocky five and six were eh, but um, yeah. Anyway, um, oh, is is the T Rex the Nephilim? <laughs> I don't know if that's a serious question or not. What do we so T Rex? Is that what we know about from the storybooks and as kids and everything? Like, should I transfer all my knowledge about Tyrannosaurus Rex into real life? Like, is that true? This dinosaur with kind of short arms, meat eating, the 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 most ferocious of all the dinosaurs. Is that true? It's probably safe to say. Yeah, uh, we we know of you know we've got dozens of T Rex skeletons now. We okay. We're able to reconstruct the entire animal with a great degree of confidence. We've got every bone just about in the skeleton from the, you know, the tip of the snout to the end of the tail. Hmm. Uh, So yeah, what, you know, what you see in museums is, is really what you get a big 40 foot long, fearsome animal, uh, short front limbs. Why? We don't yeah. really know. I would say we don't know why there's little T Rex arms. Like, what's the function? We don't know why. We we have some ideas as to why. You know, if you're, you know, what's so impressive about about T Rex is that huge skull with the big maw full of teeth. Uh, you know, all of its, uh, you know, fearsome predatory power is located in the skull. And um, if you're front loading the head like that. Um, hmm. you probably don't want big arms to go on top of it. Otherwise you're going to, you're going to tip forward, right? The center of balance on a T-Rex was over the hips. And so probably the most common thinking right now among paleontologists is that the reason for the reduced arms is because all of the weight was being put into the, the skull. And if the animal had small arm, had large arms as well, then it would have tipped forward. It wouldn't have been able to keep its balance on its hind legs. So if you're going to add weight one place, you've got to remove it from another place. And in T-Rex's case, it was the arms, which were probably not of great use. Interesting. Interesting. And what about, so Brontosaurus, that long neck and small head, um, is that accurate? And if so, does that like to get to kind of like the giraffe to eat off trees and stuff or? Yeah, well, Brontosaurus is a type of dinosaur we call a sauropod, and there are many, many sauropods. So these are the long-necked dinosaurs that, okay. that you mentioned. We know dozens and dozens and dozens of species of sauropods, but they are all built on the same basic body plan where they've got you know long tails, long necks. They vary quite widely in size, although they are all generally quite large. Uh, some of some of them were probably up to you know 80 tons. We're talking about big, big animals, the biggest animals to ever uh, wander uh, the earth, and I, I mean on land, right? I'm, yeah. I'm I'm ignoring the blue whale that I mentioned earlier. Yeah. But but yeah, we've discovered um, complete skeletons of those as well. They're probably more incomplete ones than complete ones, but we have quite a good understanding of the build of these animals and. And yeah, the you know the sauropod skeletons that you see in museums today, they're mm. I would say they're they're quite accurate. Wow, I you, you would appreciate this. You, you keep mentioning the the blue whale. I came uh, within six feet from the face of a humpback whale. It was the most oh, surreal no. moment. I mean, I, I you know the marriage to my wife by the birth of my four kids. Coming face to face with a humpback whale underwater as this thing's staring, it was one of, I mean, it, it's a close, like, I guess, third of those other. I mean, it was like. It's and, a different and, and, sense of awe. <laughs> it, it's, uh, it was, it was heart stopping. And, you know, these creatures are very play, so brilliant and playful. But it was afterward when they got, we had a guide that, you know, took us out there to make sure we didn't kill ourselves or whatever. But like, Afterward, he told us, "Oh yeah, that you know, they're they're what's it, the flapper or whatever." He's like, "It's it's the most powerful." Um, I think he said the most powerful muscle of anything on Earth. Like he said, he could if he slapped you with that, he would be. I mean, you'd just be annihilated, you know. But but they're not they're not aggressive. I mean, they're really docile. They love they love to play with you know humans or whatever. But I mean, six feet away from the eyeball, of this creature before it did its dive down to the bottom of the ocean. I mean, it was unbelievable. My gosh. Um, uh, I, there was, let's see, 
Oh, th- this answer is pro- this question is probably already answered. I'm curious if if you believe that dinosaurs are directly or indirectly mentioned in the Bible. I'm going to say no because from Genesis one twenty seven onward, at least yeah. you're dealing with um, you know, w- way later in time, dinosaurs. I guess would be assumed in er- the early parts of Genesis one. Would you say? Or I mean, well, they're still created. They, but- they would be assumed in the sense that I would agree that you know, they are part of God's creation. And and in the sense that God references all of creation in the Bible, that would include the dinosaurs as well. So they're they're referenced indirectly, I would say, you know, the word dinosaur itself uh, did not even exist, uh, you know, back in the days when the Bible was written. So we shouldn't expect to see that word used. I I guess there's some question as to whether we would expect to see some mention of dinosaurs in the Bible um, indirectly. Um, and some people have argued mainly again, young earth creationist organizations have argued that, you know, they're mentioned in the form of, uh, you know, mention of the behemoth in yeah. Job or mentioned in the Leviathan form of Leviathan yeah. in Job and it's mentioned in the Psalms. But, you know, as a paleontologist, when I read those passages, there's nothing about them that, that screams mm-hmm. dinosaur to me. Mm. You know, uh, behemoth is described as, um, you know, it says it's got the tail of a cedar, I think. Mm -hmm. Uh, Its tail sways like a cedar, I think Job describes it. Yeah, dinosaurs, at least many of them had big tails, but behemoth is often equated to being one of these long-necked sauropods, you know, uh, by, by young earth creationists. But you would think if that was the case, then there would be some mention of the giant neck too which is like the most impressive thing about these animals but there's no mention about mm. a long neck it's also said that you know the behemoth lives uh, among the reeds and lives in the water well sauropods we think were terrestrial animals that that didn't spend much time in the water you know animals that live in the water tend to have kind of uh splayed toes to allow them to walk across the mud they don't they don't have, uh, you know, the, the sort of tight hand structure that a sauropod mm-hmm. does, sort of columnar limbs to support its weight on land. Plus, sauropods, despite their size, were very, very lightly built. Their, their bones were quite hollow, uh, especially their vertebrae. And for that reason, um, they probably uh, weren't very um, stable in water. There's... One of my colleagues at the Tyrrell Museum in, in Drumheller in Alberta uh, by the name of Don Henderson, he, he's done some computer modeling of these things, and he's shown that they were quite unstable in water um, and, and would have floated probably mm. because they were because of these air sacs in their bones. And mm. they, I doubt they were able to hide under the, the reeds like, uh, mm. well, like Behemoth was apparently able to do. Um, and, you know, behemoth is described as eating grass like an ox. Well, if you go back to the fossil record, there were no grasses at the time. Oh, wow. uh, there were early sort of ancestors of grasses that would have looked maybe something like bamboo, but there were certainly no grasslands like we see today. Really? Oh. So dinosaurs were not eating grass like an ox, you know. Interesting. So, huh. you know, when I read those passages in Job about Leviathan and behemoth. Uh, as a paleontologist, I can say with good certainty that these were probably not dinosaurs that are being described here. What they were, I don't know. I'll I'll leave yeah. that to the to the theologians to decide. But uh, as a paleontologist, I would say, well, they're not dinosaurs. I can say that much with with some certainty. Well, it wouldn't make sense just the dating wise, because I mean, even. I mean, the, the most people say Job was probably written 500 plus BC. I know it takes the the, the story kind of takes place around 2000 BC, but the the book clearly was written, you know, around around the time of the exile. Um, and so for them to be referring to the details of this animal, it wouldn't make sense. Well, you know, to be it, referring to the it other thing that doesn't make sense to me is it seems to me that when the Leviathan is mentioned in the Bible, or when Behemoth is mentioned in the Bible. 
these animals describe are described as though there's only one, right? The behemoth, the Leviathan. God will come back at the end of creation and slay the Leviathan. Yeah. You know, there were hundreds and thousands of dinosaurs that lived on Earth. And, and, and yet the Bible seems to be describing one of these animals. There's one behemoth and one Leviathan. So it doesn't make sense to me that it would be a dinosaur when, you know, there were probably millions of, of uh, brontosauruses that, mm. that ever existed. And, we, you know, we certainly don't know of millions of them from the yeah. fossil record which, again, is incomplete. But the point is, these were regular, everyday animals when they were alive. And I don't know why God would begrudge one of them to slay one at the end of creation, right? If these, if, if, if we're talking about dinosaurs, it seems to me that Leviathan and Behemoth is something more than, yeah. than just a dinosaur. Well, the you know? Leviathan in particular is clearly drawing on, I mean, there's, there's a common... A metaphor for evil in the ancient world like it's you can look at parallels between you know was it job 38 39 or isaiah i think it's 24 and maybe psalm 70 something which yeah it, it's god defeating leviathan is drawn on ancient kind of myths about you know this the symbol of evil being defeated it's not really focused on giving a paleontology description of of an animal but um yeah if, if leviathan were a, you know if the Leviathan were a dinosaur, I don't know what's so evil about <laughs> any of the dinosaurs, and why why God would want to 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 slay one in that way to to make a point to to Israel or or what have you. It it just yeah it doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Plus you know the Psalms I I think it's the Psalms describe Leviathan as having you know more than one head, multiple heads. I don't know of any dinosaur you know and we and we know of probably pushing I don't know. 1300 of them now 1300 species not one of them is known to have multiple heads so it sounds more like the dragon in revelation 13 which is again a symbol of of evil but god right. god's gonna slay all the birds is what he's really getting. <laughs> it's a i i feel like that's just yeah pushing the the literalness yeah. uh, you know i i feel like that's just pushing the bible too far to try and make these animals mm -hmm. a dinosaur yeah. Well, Jordan, I got another podcast to jump onto here right now. So, uh, man, I, this has been so fun. My, um, this is one of those conversations where my knowledge curve is just went through the roof because I came into it knowing basically nothing. So thank you so much for, uh, walking us through all this, man. How can people find you? I, I you have a website I, I see here. Um, is that the best place for them to find you? Are you on social media? Uh, yeah. If they Google me, I think I've, I've got a website on our official Canadian museum of nature webpage. So if you Google me, you'll, you'll find me there. I'm on, uh, I'm on, um, Twitter occasionally at okay. Jordan underscore Malin, J-O-R-D-A-N underscore M-A-L-L-O-N. I probably don't use that as much these days, but yeah. you can find me there. You can set, feel free to send me an email is probably the best way to reach me. And uh, that'll be on the museum's website there. So yeah, happy to reach out. You know, it's not too often, Preston, that I get asked about dinosaurs from a from a Christian perspective. So. Um, it's always fun to uh, to talk about them from that perspective. So awesome! Happy well, I really enjoyed the conversation. Yeah, take care, Jordan. Thanks, Preston. This show is part of the Converge Podcast Network. Hey friends, have you been blessed or encouraged or challenged by Theology in the Raw? If so, would you consider joining Theology in the Raw's Patreon community? For as little as five bucks a month, you can gain access to a diverse group of Jesus followers who are committed to thinking deeply, loving widely, and having curious conversations with thoughtful people. We have several 
membership tiers where we where you can receive premium content. For instance, silver level supporters get to ask and vote on the questions for our monthly Patreon only podcast. They also get to see like written drafts of various projects and books I'm working on. And there's other perks for that tier. Gold level supporters get all of this and access to monthly Zoom chats where we basically blow the doors open on any topic they want to discuss. All of my, of my patrons play a vital role in nurturing the mission of the Algin Ra. And for me, just personally, interacting with my Patreon supporters has become one of the hidden blessings in this podcast ministry. So you can check out all of the info at patreon.com forward slash the Algin Ra. That's patreon.com forward slash the Algin Ra. <laughs> 